Good evening. Uh, my name is Kevin Wilson, and uh, I've been invited here to Robocon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, and tonight they asked me to talk about uh, my career for a while and kind of the games I've worked on and the things I've done. And uh, then I'll be taking questions afterwards. Uh, they've allotted me a very long time to talk about my, uh, my career, so I don't expect that it will go that long. I'll mostly we'll probably be doing questions. So, um, so just to uh, kind of introduce myself, uh, I, I started out uh, gaming when I got the, uh, the old uh, Red Box Dungeons and Dragons game. Um, bought it at uh, J.C. Penney, which is a, a big uh, kind of department store in the United States. And I was about eight years old at the time. And that was my introduction to gaming. And I played that D&D kind of only Dungeons and Dragons for many years, for, for heck, probably, probably 20 years, I would guess. And uh, when I got out of college, I went to Berkeley for artificial intelligence. And when I left college, there really wasn't much work to be had in that field in the area I was in. So I wound up uh, working at a game store part-time for several years. And uh, I ran into a friend who told me that uh, they were looking for people at a local game company and that I should maybe intern there. Uh, it turned out that I, my Dungeons & Dragons campaign at the time was based on pirates and this company was getting ready to do a pirate-based RPG, which, if you're familiar with my work at all, uh, was the 7C RPG. And that was kind of a lucky break, and I fell into the industry that way. Um, and that was the first game I worked on with John Wick. Um, and that was, a, that was a very interesting experience and very much kind of got my feet wet, uh, working as you know a, a subordinate to him underneath him on the project. And he was in charge, and... But he let me kind of run around and, and do whatever I want in, in, the, in the game, and that was, I don't know, it was, it was, it was a good first, first experience. And then for a while I worked on uh, uh, for that, in that game, and then I moved on to another game called Spycraft, which was about when the, the D20 games were coming out. And uh, we had noticed that there was no, no one had done any espionage games in a long time. Top Secret had kind of been the last one. Uh, so we did that game, and I did that with uh, my friend Patrick Capera, and that was actually quite successful for a while. Um, and that was kind of the last thing I did in role-playing games for the most part. I, uh, I switched over to a different company, Fantasy Flight Games, which is where I worked for 10 years, and it's where most people know me from at this point. Um, I, I did a couple of small role-playing game books for them there, and then... I kind of felt that the role-playing market at the time was getting very weak, and I didn't want my living to be based on that right then. So I looked around at the company and said, what else, what else do they do? What else could I, could I work on? And it, the, other, the main thing they do is board games. So I made this little board game called Magdar, which was a very simple little game in which the board destroyed itself as you played and made a very pretty prototype and left it sitting on my desk and didn't say anything to the boss about it, and just kind of waited. And eventually he walked by the desk and he saw the game sitting there, and he says, what is this? And so I explained him the game and how it worked, and he says, oh, we should publish this. And then, you know, it's very simple, and a little game. Um, so we did publish that game, and we was just like, you know, we have a hard time finding people for the board game department. Would you like to transfer over to the board game department? So, well, yeah, that, that would be really good. <laughs> so that, that worked out well for me. And uh, that was kind of my, my, my big transition over. And after that, I worked on these little games. They called them the Silver Line games for a while. And they were just kind of this big, you know, very small games. And they were $20 in the U.S. And just kind of bite-sized games. And we, I did probably five or six of those. And there was... Uh, Mutiny and Arena Maximus, and I worked on Colossal Arena, and just a lot of little games that really they they, they did what they did okay, but they never really caught fire or anything. They they did okay, um, and then we got the license for Warcraft, the board game, at one point, and that was kind of the first bigger thing that I got to work on. 
Um, and that was a, it was interesting because it was the first time I'd really done any licensed work and, uh, Blizzard, while they were nice folks, they definitely had opinions on how it should be done. They, they were all board game fans at the company. And so the first feedback we got, I want to say it was like 30 pages of, you know, single lined notes. And so we just, oh God, okay, sure. We can do some of this and just went through the whole thing and went around and around with them for a long time because like I said, they had very strong opinions on how their board game should be done. But, uh, but in the end, it was a good experience. It was fun, and uh, the game went pretty well. And because it was kind of a bigger game and a little more, more noticeable on the market, I think it got a little more attention. Uh, at the same time at the company, they were working on a game with another company called uh, War of the Rings. Um, now, I didn't have anything to do with that, but that was the game that kind of taught us how to do plastic miniatures at Fantasy Flight Games. That was, that was the first time. And that was kind of the moment where the company really took off, too, is when we learned how to do the plastics. Um, so the next game that I worked on was Doom, the board game. And that was based off the video game, and we had the big plastic miniatures, and you know they were that big. And, and that got a lot of attention all of a sudden, because everybody likes the, the, the plastic toys a lot. And uh, we had dice and plastic toys, and you could build the board in different ways, and... That, that took off really well, and people really liked that game a lot. Um, and so we started kind of gravitating towards that kind of thing because it had done so well for us. Um, we also had another couple of licenses we were looking at, uh, Game of Thrones in particular, and this was long before the, the TV shows, back just the books were out. Uh, but we had a card game there, and we also had a card game based on Call of Cthulhu, the H.P. Lovecraft uh, uh, story RPG, and we had all this art for the cards that we'd used in this in the collectible card games. And we thought, you know, we have all this art. We should do some board games for these sorts of things. We should we should do something with all this. So we did the the Game of Thrones the board game, which went for kind of a a wood elegant look to that one, kind of trying to to match the setting a bit. And then the other one, we I ran into a man named Richard Lanius at Origins, which is a convention there, and they have, uh, they call it the Breezeway, which is just this little hallway, and you often see game designers showing off their prototypes and things there. And Richard Lanius, you know, he actually released a very popular game back in the Arkham Horror, the first version of it, and he was there, and he had this elaborate, hand-painted, you know, this enormous hand-painted version of the game, and I wandered past, and I was like, Arkham Horror, that sounds familiar to me. I should hang out and play this for a little while and check this out. And so I sat there playing it, and he said, yeah, and we're getting ready to do a new version of this. Uh, and I said, well, you know, if this doesn't work out for you with this company you're talking to right now, and, you know, give us a call. And I gave him my business card and said, you know, let us, let us you know, give, get in touch with us if, you, if you'd like. And, and obviously he did. And he wound up, the game came to us at Fantasy Flight. And I got assigned to the project kind of because I had scouted him out, if nothing else. And we, we decided that the game needed a, some serious overhauls. At the time, it was still a roll and move game where you would roll dice and move that many spaces on the board. Um, and that just wasn't the sort of thing that people were going to want to, to buy nowadays. So we did a... a uh, a lot of changes to the game, but I've worked very closely with Richard on it, and he's a wonderful gentleman, very southern gentleman in the southern hospitality style of, if, if you've, I don't know if the stereotype carries over here, but but he was very, very genteel uh, man, and, and uh, was very courteous to the point where when I did all this work on the game, you really had no uh, obligation to share credit with me. You know, it was still his game, but... Uh, he said to me, you know, you've done a lot of work on this. Why don't we, why don't we share credit on it? And I said, sure, I'd, I'd love that. That would be great. And uh, obviously that game did really, really, really well for us um, and has a lot of really hardcore, rabid fans for it, people who have played the game 100, 200 times a year even. Um, and that game has sold 
incredibly well. I spawned seven, eight, nine expansions. I, I forget. It's, it's a lot of expansions and pre-painted miniatures, all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, so that was obviously kind of a big, big turning point in my career even, and, and for the company even, because that is something that still uh, drives Fantasy Flight very strongly today. Um, and I've done some other games. Uh, there was Android, which is a very kind of experimental board game. Uh, and it did pretty well, but it was uh, cyberpunk. It was almost like Blade Runner, the board game, if you've seen the movie. Um, uh, but it was trying to kind of do something different with board games and tell stories in a very different way. And I think it was probably a little bit too complex and a little too avant-garde for, for the market. But, you know, it was a good time anyways. I liked, I liked getting to work on it. And it still sold enough to pay for itself, so no harm done there. So, uh, But what it really did is it, it's, it had that world attached to it, and that's actually spawned a lot of good things for Fantasy Flight games, too. They've got the Netrunner game now set in that same setting, uh, and Infiltration, and um, they'll probably do some more stuff with it, and they've got novels and all sorts of stuff there. So that was, uh, was kind of cool, and then I got to help design that world setting, um, which I kind of hadn't really done any world design since, since 7C at the time, so that was a, always a nice change of pace for me. Um, and more recently, I've done a couple more licensed games, but uh, as of uh, October of last year, I left Fantasy Flight Games. Now I'm a freelance designer, and so I'm out on my own now and uh, a full-time game designer, so paying my rent by designing games still. Um, so this is a bit different for me, and it's a bit scary, but it also means that I can kind of work on whatever I feel like now and at my own rate. So that's... It's a very different thing, especially since I was kind of a salaried employee for 15 years doing games before that. So, um, you know, it's, it's an exciting opportunity and everything, and it's going to be very different. And yes, we've only killed a very little amount of time so far. So there's my career. Um, so I know it's a lot of time to ask you guys to fill with questions, but I think I will start taking some questions now, nonetheless. Hi, I'm Vincent. Hello. Um, we, we met earlier. <laughs> um, congratulations, you're stepping out uh, on your own. Oh, thank you very much. I didn't know that. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, no, I, had, uh, I just decided it was time to try it out. So. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Like, I hope that, I hope that kicks serious ass. Uh -huh. um, and I just had one, one little trivial question, which is, is the Netrunner game design, is that Richard Garfield? Yes, that's uh, Richard Firefield design. It was actually from, from the, the second original. CCG that he did yeah, after yeah, yeah. Magic. And it flopped at the time, which I want to say is because it really wasn't well suited to the CCG model. Yeah. But it, now that it's an LCG where they just release a set pack of cards every month, I think it's doing much, much better now yeah. under that model. It, it was always my favorite. Yeah, I know. It's, it's a very strong game. Yeah, so, yeah. And Richard Garfield is a brilliant designer, of yeah. course. So. Very cool. Thank you. Uh, yes. Any more questions? <laughs> All right, thank you. Good night, everyone. <laughs> no, uh, seriously, anybody have any questions? Here we go. Go long. Yeah, just a small question. You said you studied artificial intelligence, right? Yes. Uh, well, it's sort of a double question. Do you uh -huh. ever, like, uh, miss that field? Would you ever, like, want to work there? And... Uh, what sort of influence do you see it has had you on you as a game designer? Uh, well, I, I liked the work. It was very interesting. But uh, at the same time, I feel like I've found my calling with game design now. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life if I, if I can, if I can afford to. But uh, uh, the other, to take the second part of your question, uh, it's definitely affected the way I design games. Um, it's affected the way I think about game design and... Arkham Horror, for instance, actually has a kind of very simple artificial intelligence built into it, which is based off a concept that uh, is called the Turing machine, um, which is, uh, I won't go into it too much, but it's an artificial intelligence concept. Well, I mean, there's time. Uh, <laughs> Touche. Um, <laughs> no, well, it's, it's a, basically the idea is that a, a turning machine is a machine that has different states to it. Like this is, um, 
uh, it's hard to explain the state concept, but in each state, there are a limited number of different directions the machine could do different things. And if it receives, inst for instance, instruction A while in state one, it does this thing. If it in receives instruction B while in state one, it does this other thing. And those two instructions might do something completely different in state two. Um, so it's this kind of branching, uh, rudimentary calculator type of thing. And that's kind of something that I used as a model when I was working on the Mythos cards and such for Arkham Horror. Um, very rudimentary in Arkham Horror, of course, but, uh, but that's where the, the thought process came from originally. Um, so, you know, yes, it's definitely affected the way I think about it and also made sure that I had plenty of uh, probability classes and uh, first order logic classes, which have been a big help as a game designer. Um, that's kind of the cornerstone of dice and card mathematics in general. So, uh, next question. Hi. Oh. Yep. Okay. Hi. Uh, um, you moved from role playing games to card game. Uh, sorry, board games. Are you planning on another invasion to something else? Um, you know. Uh, no, currently, I have a good reputation in board games, so I'll probably stick there as long as the board games do well. But I do kind of I consider myself a game designer, not a not a board game designer ultimately. So, if the market completely changes over and there's no work to be had in board games, then it'll be time to do something else for a while. But I do love the board games. I like I, I I'm I'm good at that. I feel and I I like I wouldn't mind continuing to do that for many years. Um. Hopefully, the, the, the way that the money goes and the, the, the market out there goes will allow me to do that, but we'll see. You know, future's always changing. Have you tried any other genres? Um, well, we did, uh, we, we did kind of a digital adaptation of uh, Elder Sign, and that was kind of an interesting project. And I was involved a lot with that. And then with the expansions for Elder Sign, Omens, I guess it's called, um, which is on the, the iPad and the iPhone and all that. Uh, so that was kind of a nice thing, and, it, and I have so I have a digital credit if I need to try that out at some point. So, do it yourself a lot of board games or role playing games? Uh, yeah, uh, role playing games I haven't played in a couple of years, but I was very active in, until uh, my my last GM moved out of town, I guess. Um, <laughs> after that, mostly I have a Wednesday night group that I meet with every week to play board games with. And sometimes it's something I'm working on. Uh, I try to keep that to a minimum as much as I can, just so Wednesday night is just kind of for fun. And so I'll play other people's board games as much as possible there. And then I'll have other groups that I do play testing with a lot more often. So, um, But we play a lot of uh, Cosmic Encounter and Whiz War and the old game called Screaming Eagles, which is goofy and lots of dice. And... Uh, Games like that, we just any any kind of thing, but um, those are the games that get to the table a lot, I guess. There we go. Do you have anything in the works? Um, yes, actually, I've got a couple games that I'm working on. Uh, one of which is a co-design with my friend Eric Lang. He's done a lot of the card games for Fantasy Flight games. The the Game of Thrones card game, he did that one, and uh, the new Star Wars card game, he did that, and he also worked on Couriers. Um, and so we designed a game together called uh, Generation Hex, which is a game that I'm going to be actually showing off around the show this weekend. And uh, so that's probably going to go to Kickstarter sometime within the next two months-ish or so. They're waiting on art now, but otherwise the game is done. So that'll be the next project I, that gets released. Um, I've got a small card game that I can't really talk about yet. And then three adventure games that are in the works. But again, I can't really get into specifics because all the contracts and stuff. And a, a Euro game that a German company is looking at. Uh, and there's a lot of work I've been doing lately. So uh, lots of things are in the works. Unfortunately, I can't talk about too many of them yet. Um, companies get very crabby. Um, which of your games, um, the games you've designed or been uh, in the project, uh, is your personal favorite and why? 
Um, I have to say Arkham Horror is probably my personal favorite of the stuff I've gotten to work on that, that I was mostly involved in the design. And that's because uh, as a game designer, you get to show off your games. It's a curse and a privilege in that I've played each of my games probably in excess of two or 300 times with people. Uh, and with in Descent's case, for instance, I've always been the overlord, except I want to say twice ever. So uh, I've played my games to death, as it were. Um, Arkham Horror is one of the few games that I've worked on that really has held up to that number of plays where I still have fun when I play it because it's always different. Uh, and so I really appreciate that. It makes me happy about the design that, that I can still enjoy it, unlike so many of the other games where I'm just like, oh, here we go again. All right, fine. <laughs> You know, I love the games, but after the two or three hundredth play of it, it's eh, it gets to be a bit of a chore after a while. Yeah. Next question. Uh, how much uh, computer uh, or uh, have you used much computer uh, in help uh, when you design your games, like in playtest or? Deep designing mechanics or like that? Um, mostly uh, I don't do a lot of that, although I will occasionally run a dice simulation if I'm doing something unusual with dice. Um, I do do all the, 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 the uh, prototype design on the computer. I use InDesign a lot and some Photoshop. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> But I don't tend to make a lot of like computerized prototypes or anything like that. That's that's more work than it's usually worth at the end of the day. Um, so, like I said, mostly dice simulations and uh, and layout for the actual prototypes and such. Um, so that's that's mostly what I use the computer for with the, the game design. Uh, next. Why did you leave? fantasy flight games? Um, well, uh, as a staff employee at the company, I uh, got a salary and it was nice and everything. It was a lot, very stable job, which was, you know, can't, can't underplay that. That's very nice. Uh, but at the same time, as a, as a salaried employee, I didn't receive any royalties on anything ever. Um, so while I could do this well, I could never really do that well if something took off and became very successful. And a lot of my games did actually become very successful. So at the end of the day, I decided, well, you know, it's time to take a gamble on this and, you know, work for royalties now instead of the salary. Um, I also had kind of reached a point where I wanted to start doing different types of games than the, the Fantasy Flight style of games, which is fun, but I, I wanted to do others too. Like I said, I've done a Euro game now and a little card game and all these other things. And these weren't things that I could get published through Fantasy Flight Games. So part of it was just looking for a change, and uh, I had just felt that I had gone as far there as I could, and it was time to, to shut out on my own and try it for myself. Oh, we got one over here. Go long. Oops. <laughs> Uh, could you tell us more about the process of designing the new Arkham Horror? What was the original version like? What were the reasons for the changes or additions you made, so forth? Um, well, uh, I worked, like I said, very close with Richard Lanius on that. Uh, the original prototype that was turned into us at Fantasy Flight was kind of similar to the Chaosium edition. Uh, if you've ever seen that, there's kind of a... Uh, I have no better word for it, uh, kind of a Candyland style board where you're moving along a little path. And the, it was very nice art and all this stuff, but we really didn't feel like the modern market, you know, post Settlers of Catan and all this was going to tolerate that roll and move on, on the board and, and have all that luck like that. I mean, there's still plenty of luck in Arkham Horror, but it's kind of a different style. Um, I was also responsible for adding in the skill sliders because I wanted to add a further element of strategy and kind of control to the players that they could try and, and increase their speed at the expense of their sneak or whatever. Um, and the final thing that I, the, the, the other big thing that I helped add in that, that I was very proud of was the, the, the ancient ones, uh, the way that they have effects on the game and they make the game play differently depending on which one you're using. 
So each one is an effect, kind of a different game variant. And that adds a lot to the game's replay value, which uh, was something I was very interested in improving because this is a cooperative game. Uh, your opponents aren't really the reason you keep coming back to the game. You know, in other games, the competition can can keep things fresh. With a cooperative game, the game itself has to have a variety of play that makes you want to play it more than once. Um, so those were the main changes that that I was involved in. But uh, you know, it was just a substantial amount of work and. Richard was nice enough to let me share credit with him for it. So, um, next question, and I think we've got someone who's right behind you, up up the wall there. Uh, because the uh, Lovecraftian I'll speak a little lower into okay. the uh, because the Lovecraftian mythos is, is so broad. How did you pick and choose the bits you were going to use in the game and? which bits you were going to emphasize in the game and which you sort of left out or something? Uh, well, that was pretty easy. Uh, Arkham Horror was the Call of Cthulhu board game, which is based on the role-playing game Call of Cthulhu. So what I did was I broke out the Call of Cthulhu role-playing book and opened it up and went through it and did exactly what it said to do. <laughs> um, it was a wonderful blueprint and I followed it very closely, actually. Um, so it, the reason I did that too was that there's a, a number of hazy copyright issues with various HP Lovecraft and other mythos creatures, but I knew that the Chaosium guys had done the research already and had made sure that these were clear or that they had the rights to them. So if I used only what they had, we were we weren't going to get any trouble. So that that seemed like the good the good way to do it to me. So. Um, next question. All right, probably over here, so you can probably reach him. Are all the uh, uh, persons taken from book Call of Cthulhu, or did you um, made some of your own characters in the game oh, the, the, the investigators and the NPCs in the game. Uh, most of the NPCs and the characters, a lot of them are from the original edition of Arkham Horror. Um, the names are all the same. We just added more character to them, made them more, 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 more personalized, I guess. Um, and again, uh, so like Sheriff Engel is from the old game, uh, Deputy Dingby, old game, that kind of thing. And then uh, eight of the 16 characters were from the original game. And then the other eight, we just kind of made up the names for them and kind of followed the same style. And again, like I said, I looked at the uh, Call of Cthulhu role-playing book and said, okay, here are all the different professions they say you can be as a character, so I will dig into this and take ideas for what kind of different investigators I want to make. <coughs> so um, that's where we went with that. Uh, next question. Okay. <laughs> Look out. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, <laughs> you worked on, on quite many games that have a very like thick atmosphere. How do you uh, feel about the subject matter of your games? Uh, how do you approach the story or, or atmosphere of the game? Um, for me, I'm always most concerned with uh, a game having like an emotional impact for the players. Um, so Arkham Horror tried to build a sense of growing dread as you play the game. Um, and anytime there's a story, I just wanted to like emphasize that part. Uh, obviously. You know, I have some very large, complicated games, and a lot of that is in service to making the story and the world setting kind of come alive as much as possible. Um, so I guess I kind of do put that first above anything else for the most part. Um, I, I, I think that's answered the question. If not, you can elaborate some more, whichever. What about, uh, did you have an original setting for Android or... Uh, yeah, Android was an original setting that we came up with. Um, like I said, I, we knew we wanted to do something kind of like Blade Runner, but we didn't want to exactly, you know, copy it or anything. So we had this idea that uh, there would be two different competing types of androids in the setting that were being uh, kind of uh, people were being prejudiced against, and so we had the, the the mechanical androids and the biological androids that were clones. Of people and having those kind of created a bit more hostility in the setting, which I thought was nice. And then we had the uh, 
the beanstalk was kind of the centerpiece, which was uh, the the space elevator. Basically, it's uh, lets you take goods up into space uh, and kind of at a very cheap rate. It's a science fiction concept that's fairly fairly common, I guess, these days. Um, and so, just I wanted to do kind of a hard sci-fi uh, setting as much as possible. You know, things that I felt were at least plausible uh, and weren't complete fantasy science fiction stuff. Um, and so that's kind of how I approached that. And so me and a friend or two, we hashed out a bunch of ideas for the, uh, the Android setting and different characters for it. And then everything else just kind of came out naturally as we were working on the game and, and then writing the text and stuff. So. Thanks. Oh. Yeah. Since I'm right here, uh, which one do you prefer more, uh, creating new uh, like IPs or using an existing one like Lovecraft or World of Warcraft or whatever? Which one do you prefer as a game designer? I, I actually like them both, honestly. Um, one of the things uh, that you don't want to do in game design is have things get, things get stale on you. And so I like working on licenses and then changing it up and working on something original and then changing that up sometimes even in developing the game that somebody else has designed and kind of finishing that and fine tuning it for them. It keeps things interesting and different for me so that I'm always kind of doing something new every month. That's, that's a lot of fun for me. How long, how long does it take on average to design one board game? Um, hmm. Or is there a great variety of? Uh, it depends, but uh, I would say I generally spend about two to three months on a board game. Typically, um, Arkham Horror was about three months long to design it, uh, two months for the game, and another month to write all the text for it. Uh, there's a lot of text in that game. Um, uh, Descent, I think, was a two-month project. Um, part of it too, remember, was I was an employee at a company for 10 years. And so they told me how long I would have to work on a game. Mm -hmm. And I would, by God, get the game done in that amount of time. Or, you know, there would be trouble. So uh, I got very good at hitting hitting these deadlines over time. And I'm still kind of trying to keep myself to that same standard now as a freelancer so that uh, I can, you know, continue to, to, to produce it on a professional uh, scale in, in a short amount of time, which is very helpful for me as a professional. So, um, two to three months is about average for it. Uh, the longest things I've ever done, uh, I had six months for Road to Legend, which was an extremely elaborate expansion for Descent that involved a whole campaign setting, almost like a like a campaign for D and D or something that you would play through. Um, and I had six months for Sid Meier's Civilization um, because that one had four different paths to victory that I had to balance as closely as possible to each other. And so that took a long time, a lot of testing and a lot of iterations to, to different versions of getting it right. And, you know, it's still not perfect, but it was pretty close for four different victory conditions that are all completely different from each other. So uh, next, the other one over here. <laughs> I broke my nail. Anyways, um, two to three months sounds awfully short amount of uh, amount of time. Is it really? Um, do you really work uh, from the actual idea to a complete game, or do you keep like a journal when you where you put any anything that comes mm -hmm. to mind and then? maybe flip back to a couple of years when you need some ideas. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, part of the way I work out, too, is that uh, uh, I tend to schedule several projects out so that I know what my next four or five games are going to be at the time. And then while I'm working on the first one, I can be thinking of ideas down the stream for the next few, and then I'll write those down. And that kind of helps streamline so, the whole process. Yeah, so if you... If you have an idea that doesn't fit the concept you are working right then, then you exactly might not. you can always okay. slide it down the row, basically to yeah, the next one. Yeah, that sounds better. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> anyway, yeah. And, and again, part of it is just professionally, I had to do it for so long that wow. I kind of got used to being able to do it. Yeah, of so which is a useful skill these days. So 
One over here. Oh, no. Look out. <laughs> um, I abandon a whole bunch of games. I don't. I have never worked professionally. Mm -hmm. um, have you ever? Have you ever abandoned a game? Do you ever come to a game that just doesn't work? Completely abandoned a game and, and, and like, thrown it away. Hmm. Well, I mean, it goes into the swamp. The swamp provides, right? Yeah. I, I don't actually think I have uh, I ever completely thrown away a game. I've stripped a few of them down pretty pretty close to the skeleton and but then build uh back up. built them back up but uh i don't know part of it is again uh I, there's some games i have designed that weren't that were never published uh -huh. but but i finished them ultimately before they were but, uh, so it was someone else's decision not yeah. to publish them so uh as far as i'm concerned there's like i would always carry a game through to completion some way or another um even if it takes a while you know put it aside for a bit and come back to it um, I don't know. I guess I'm stubborn that way somehow, yeah. but I think it helps me out again as a professional that I would always kind of doggedly finish things yeah. like that. So, I don't know. Yeah. That's impressive. I'm impressed. Uh, yeah. uh, you mentioned Kickstarter uh, as part of the, the, was it Generation X? Generation oh, yeah. X, yeah. Uh, as a freelancer, have you considered publishing a game completely like on Kickstarter and what what's your opinion on that? Well, uh, I think what a people a lot of people don't really realize about doing your own game like yeah. that is that you then have to have it manufactured and shipped out to everybody yourself, and that's a huge undertaking and an enormous amount of work that is kind of invisible to the fans for the most part. But having worked at a game company and kind of seen all parts of the uh, all parts of the recipe that go into the pie, there's parts of the thing that I just don't want to have to touch or deal with myself at all. I won't say that I'll never do something like that. I might go through a company that would take care of that part of things. There's a number of them out there now that are they're doing that sort of thing. But uh, it would have to be for a game that I thought really that I want to keep control of this and I want to own this IP and I want to do other games in this setting or something. That would be the sort of thing where I would think about Kickstartering it. Yeah. Um, other than that, typically uh, the other danger about going it alone on a Kickstarter and that sort of thing is that when you're the only one, you know, doing a game like that, you have full control over it, but you're also the only one who cares. So you have to, you have to pilot the boat and you have to row and you have to, you know, do everything and keep it moving. And that can be very dangerous. I, I actually kind of prefer to have a company, someone invested in my games out there, you know, pushing for it. So they'll make money too. And and that's good for both of us, I find. And I like that way because it, it lets me continue to go on to the next thing that I need to work on. Um, and I don't have to get bogged down in one game. And, and I can keep doing the thing that I love, which is the design and the development stuff, and not become a businessman too much. <laughs> uh, next question. There. With the assist. As a developer of... Uh, Call of Cthulhu game series. Do you have any favorite character in the game? Hmm. Uh, I think my favorite character is probably got to be Ash Can Pete. Um, but why? The, the the hobo with the dog. I don't know. He's just <laughs> he's he's a great character, and I I just had a certain affection for him when I first came up. He's also uh, mechanically of the characters in the in the Arkham Horror set, the base set. He's the weirdest of them all. And he was the character that was by far the hardest to design because I had strong ideas for everybody else. And then I had this hobo. <laughs> and I just kind of stared at him for a while. I'm like, what on earth does the hobo do? Yeah, I guess he gets things out of the trash. Yeah, actually, that's what he does. you know. And then there was the mechanic. But it, it, he was tough. But at the same time, I kind of got attached to him because of that, I guess. Um, next. Okay, so you earlier uh, commented that you you still play Arkham Horror uh, for just for fun. Mm -hmm. uh, how many and how strict uh, extra house rules do you have to make it harder? Um, 
I usually, when I play Arkham Horror, I'll play with one expansion, maybe two expansions, typically. And we do the very common house rule of that you have the person to your right or your left, whichever, read the cards out for you when you have your little adventures, your encounters. And if you have to make a decision, they will stop there instead of telling you what's going to happen. And you have to make the decision without knowing what's going to happen if you fail or succeed. So it's like, oh, you, you see a golden idol sitting up on a thing. Do you take it? <laughs> um, maybe. <laughs> sure, let's roll some dice. You know? <laughs> oh, that was a bad idea. All right. But uh, that's, that's kind of my favorite house rule for the game. And it's, it's pretty minor, but it makes it a little more fun, I think. A little more role-playing-like. Um. Uh, do you have... Um, I'm sorry, this is a stupid question for... Yeah. But uh, do you have anything to do with the Mansion of Madness? Uh, no, uh, that was uh, that was Corey. Corey Kaniska was his game there. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, have you played it? Uh, I haven't, actually. There's one of the things people always assume I played everything at Fantasy Flight Games. No, no. They put out no, a lot just, of games. I so. just uh, what I wanted to know if you liked or didn't like the way they have... Um, I don't used know. your I, your characters and so on, but if you haven't played it, then yeah, I, I actually I never got around to playing that one at all. So, <laughs> useless, so. um, it, like I said, there was just a lot of different games, always kind of going through Fantasy Fight, and obviously I played all the games that I worked on, and I would play a couple of the others here and there, but uh, beyond that, wouldn't necessarily even know some of the projects were happening until they would go out to the stores. So and it's a reasonably big company these days, so. Right. Um, about the expansions, um, do you when you when you start designing a game, do you then then think that maybe someday this will have expansions, or do you uh, design them after you have released the game and add there things that you you think like you should have added in the first place? Mm -hmm. uh, well, with Arkham Horror, that was kind of one of the first games that I did that wound up having expansions. But when Richard and I were talking about it uh, very early on, I had a I had a feeling that it was going to go somewhere and I said you know one of the things that we should do is if it's successful we should have you be able to go to other cities and so like uh, Dunwich and Kingsport and Innsmouth were kind of at least there was the glimmer of an idea for those even from the start for Arkham Horror Excuse me. and uh, the idea that you would take the train to go to these other places was always there um, nowadays, when I do a game design, I try to always leave some room for an expansion in case it happens. But if it doesn't happen, I always try to make the game solid enough on its own that that's okay that it didn't get an expansion too. Um, so there has to be some flexibility there. But uh, the thing is that expansions are so... Uh, I guess you want to call them easy money in the today's market. Everybody... Uh, everybody likes the expansions for the most part. Um, some people say they don't on principle, but really sales suggest that's not true. Um, so it's a good idea as a company professionally just to leave some room to grow a game if there's really an audience for it that wants to come back and revisit that game. Um, so I don't leave bits out. Some people have accused us uh, designers over the years, oh, you left out that important bit there. And it's like, no, usually it's just we came up with that later and it seemed like a good idea that would that would fit well with what was there. Like uh, the the madness and injury cards that went into Dunwich. Now, some folks were like, oh, you should have put that in the base game. I'm like, well, we didn't think of it. So that, that came later. So uh, we try to leave room for expansions, but uh, not too much room, I guess. You don't want to... You don't want an incomplete game. That's no good. All right. Uh, next question. <coughs> Somebody asked about favorite characters, but what about favorite monsters? Oh, my favorite monster in the Call of Cthulhu is definitely the Hound of Tindalos. <laughs> um, they're super creepy. They come out of the corner at you and you're dead. And what are you going to do, live in a little round room for the rest of your life? That's no good. And, you know, 
the story is from the guy peers through time, sees something millions of years in the past, and then it comes after him through time itself and then comes out of the wall and kills him. That's freaking horrible. I mean, that's, that's a terrifying monster. And I think that that kind of concept is just one of the neatest ones out of, out of the mythos. Thanks. Oh, maybe back behind you. <laughs> okay, um, I'm not sure if this uh, has been asked already, but uh, uh, Arkham Horror is one of the few games that uh, the setup takes like half an hour, and the whole game can be over in one first turn. So well, <laughs> is that an intentional actually... thing to make people mad in a real... <laughs> Uh, well, spirit of uh, Call of Duty, or <laughs> well, technically, the only thing I really set out to make people mad uh, was uh, I just set out to destroy every table that you could ever set up the game on, and I just said, "No, nope, I can do. I can make it bigger. I can. I can keep going. I can make it bigger uh, until there's really not any table that will hold the thing anymore, uh, without like pushing two tables together or so. So that was my real evil goal there." Um, <laughs> But I wanted to correct you that it's technically possible that you lose the game on setup. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, for, it's for a acting. wild astronomical set of things that all happen together, but it is possible. So, you know, I take pride in that. Even though it's frustrating, it really keeps up with the spirit of Call of Duty. Yeah, Thanks. it's, you know, uh, I, uh, early on, I tried to be much nicer about the designs with Arkham Horror. The, the base game is much more friendly to the players. Um, and I got so much grief. That's too easy. It's too easy. I was, okay, I'll make it harder. It's too easy. It's too easy. Okay, I'll make it harder. It's too easy. Too easy. Okay, well, here's the end now. This is really hard. I think we're good. No more. <laughs> All right, here we go. Have you done I don't know. I kind of like the idea of having a board game that no table can contain. So. <laughs> Huh? Um, who actually create those concept arts for characters and how long does it take to create a one? Well, uh, for Arkham Horror, for instance, um, all of the art is from the collectible card game, the, the Call of Cthulhu CCG. Um, and we had two or three sets already done at that time, so they plopped all the cards down in front of me and said, okay, you can order 20 pieces of art, original art for the game, the rest of it has to come out of this stuff here. And so I went, all right. And I picked out all these characters that I felt <clears throat> could work with things and picked out monster art that felt could work with things. And most of the new art wound up having to be the locations on the board because there really wasn't any locations to speak of in the, in the card game. And then there were some items. And if you look closely, like some of them are like cropped out a little, like this thing's hanging on a wall in one card somewhere. But we, we zoomed in on it. It's great. Um, so I had to get pretty creative about that because we had a very limited art budget for the game. But that was kind of the point, too, was that we were trying to use the art again from, from the Call of Cthulhu CCG. So it was, it was kind of a win win for the company. And we made it work. So I, I don't think most people really. Uh, had any complaints about it? I, I, a lot of people have said it looks really nice, the art and such. So, I feel we we, we pulled that off pretty well. I thought. Uh, next question uh, about the Arkham Horror game. We keep continuing with it. Yeah, sure, uh, sure. You've told us your favorite investigator and monster. What's your favorite ancient? Uh, favorite ancient one? Yeah. Okay. Um. Let's see. Hmm. Uh, mechanically in the game, I have to go with Gatanathawa, which is in one of the last expansions. And he has these eight tokens that are face down, and one of them has his face on it. And the story of Gatanathawa in the, the mythos is that if you see an image of Gatanathawa, even if it's just like a, per a photograph or something, then your skin hardens to leather and you're paralyzed forever, and you're just done. And uh, so the mechanic is is that every time you get two or more clue tokens in the game at once, you have to flip over one of these eight tokens. And if his face is on it, you're dead. Uh, incidentally, this is how you can lose the game on setup. Um, well, I not really lose the game, but you can be devoured on setup, I should say. The character dies instantly. Um, 
But uh, otherwise, you just leave that one face up, and next time somebody finds two clue tokens, they turn another one face up. And that keeps going, and I think, until you have four of them face up, and then it flips back down. And uh, that mechanic captured more perfectly the feeling of dread and horror that I wanted in Arkham Horror than anything we, else we ever did. It's just people just... I don't want to do this. So um, this one, uh, all right, you know, and and that was always my favorite thing there. Uh, thematically, I still have to go with I think Nyarlathotep, the because he has, he's the only ancient one that actually really cares about humanity, I guess, and he's just he's just here to mess with us really, and he's got all these different forms and different incarnations that he can take, and he's just wonderfully creepy. I like him a lot. All right. Yeah, and the second question of oh, sure. Ailton, I'd like to say this, that we call Gatton, we want, we want to test lots of investigators. Let's take Gatton <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, or that's a good one to churn through them with. So. Yeah, but the second question, you have played horror three, 300 times or something. What's your win rate? Um, <laughs> pretty good these days, actually. Um, if you really know the game inside and out, and I do, uh, you can get up a pretty good win rate, even with the harder expansions and stuff. Uh, there's there's some quiet strategy in the game that's not obvious to most people, but you know, like I said, I've played the thing 300 times, and I know every card in the game more or less. So I know when to go to the science building or when to go to the library and all that stuff, and and go fishing for something specific. Um, uh, so I don't know. I've got a lot of useless information packed away up here now after all those games. So um, yeah. Next question. <coughs> um, so you say you play still board games that you don't design. Is there any new game that you're hyped about that, that has come to your attention or you've played for the first time lately or anything? Any, any particular one that you feel that's great just now? Um, well, it's not super new, but uh, King of Tokyo by Richard Garfield is a really wonderful game. Uh, it's very small and compact, but it packs a lot of fun into that little game. Garfield's, like I said, he's a really brilliant designer, and he can do stuff that I can only kind of like, oh, yeah, I wish I'd done that. Very good. Yeah, nice done. Um, and so he can do things just very elegantly and compactly like that. And, of course, the expansion has a panda in it, which is great. So, you know. <laughs> Um, that's that's my game that I'm I think I'm been most enjoying that's been recent. So <coughs> next up, Aliyup. So how complex and rules heavy do you like your games? Uh, personally, well, I probably play lighter games than I design for the most part. Um, Mostly because it's just easier to, to get the group to play it that I play with. Um, I don't personally have an upper limit on complexity for the most part of what I'll play and what I'll give a try. But uh, in terms of getting it to the table and playing it with others and everything else, they skew a little bit towards the lighter end of the scale. Like I said, we play a lot of Cosmic Encounter, King of Tokyo, Quarriers, I guess. Um, games like that. Um, and they've gotten to be kind of a busier group as the years have gone on, too. So uh, the game sessions have gotten shorter, and sometimes they want to play two or three games in the evening. So we'll play something really quick and play a couple of those. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I have played all kinds of crazy things. I taught myself Magic Realm a couple years back, and that's about as elaborate a game as you could ever hope to find on the market. You know, it's I, I don't even know that you could publish it these days, honestly. You might be able to, but it'd be really iffy. <coughs> right. um, that answers your question. Uh, all right, next question. More of a professional one. You mentioned how you like to, well, b like or like, but blot down ideas you can fit into your current games and then like elaborate on them later. And you like uh, shortly or longly if you want to walk us through your design process. Like when you pick up an idea you've liked, what do you do when? How does that like step by step turn into a finalized game? Uh, well, I usually try and think about what kind of game that I want to make in broad terms initially. 
like I want to do a kung fu game or I want to do a dungeon crawl game or something like that. And then I make a list of what I feel are the important elements of that kind of game. You know, what, what is it that makes the dungeon crawl experience fun for people? And I write that down and I just keep breaking things down into smaller and smaller chunks until things are bite-sized enough that I feel like I can start filling things in. And I kind of work from that. Uh, sometimes I have a particularly nifty mechanic that I want to work with, like, uh, for Doom and Descent, I had the dice idea that there were going to be dice that you rolled one time and it would determine both if you hit and how much damage you did at the same time. So you wouldn't have to roll once and then again for damage. Um, so that was a, kind of an integral thing going into that design. Uh, with Civilization, there was the idea of the tech pyramid instead of this crazy tech tree. It would just be like, I can have two level one techs and then I can put a level two tech on top of that and so on and so forth. And that was kind of the core uh, element of that game design. So I usually try to have like one, one nifty mechanic that, that stands out a bit on the market or stands out for people and then support it from there. Yep, so um, you have ideas about the, like a genre <laughs> and then you like blot down your ideas and then turn those into mechanics rather than work like think of a mechanic and then like uh, think of the story on top of those yeah uh, I try to th I try to design an experience more than I do a game um, I, f I look and see how I want players to feel when they're playing the game the psychology at the table um, and that is the most important thing to me that's what keeps people excited about a game and wanting to come back to it uh, if it delivers that drama or that, that tension or something you know uh, you know Arkham Horror is dread uh, descent is, you know, you feel like a hero. Um, civilization is watching your civilization grow and kind of that feeling of almost like pride, I guess, really, in, in the, your accomplishments of your civilization as they grow and learn more things. And, and those are all like just kind of Hey, what was I saying? I have no idea. Something about your feelings. Uh, hello? Yeah, there we go. All right. <laughs> Take four. <laughs> Hopefully I won't kill this one too. They're just dropping like flies up here. All right, so let's go ahead and go to the next question because I have no idea what I was saying anymore. Oh, you were saying something great. You were saying that you start with how you want the player to feel and then you go to that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So, have you played the second edition of Descent? Uh, very briefly. Uh, it actually, I wasn't on the design team for that one at all. Um, looks good to me. I, you know. Yeah, that was my question about: uh, Do you feel that they made it better? They definitely made it shorter and more simpler, but they made it different. It, and yeah. uh, I think that it was an appropriate design decision for the current marketplace, where people were wanting shorter games and simpler. And I feel that was. It's not what I personally would have done, because I did do a game called Descent earlier, and that's what I would have done. <laughs> but I don't feel that they made bad decisions making the game. It's just a very different style of game. Um, and I think it's fun, and a lot of people have enjoyed it, and, and it's a good job. So, yeah, no worries. Uh, next question. Oh, look out. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, about game mechanics. What random effect 
uh, depending on dice or cards you prefer or something else? Um, I, I like cards or I like them both actually. Like I, I like mechanics that create drama in games and some random chance to a game means that it can't be just this calculated cold uh, game. There's actually moments of, of fear. Is my plan going to work? Is the monster going to eat me? You know, you just you can't know that before you you sit down and you roll the dice or you draw the card. Um, there's actually <coughs> um, one of the things I love about the cards, and uh, particularly the cards in Arkham Horror were a good time, in that I was able to tell little stories with a number of them. Uh, in the oh, I want to say it was Dunwich. Yeah, it was Dunwich expansion. There's a card in there for there's a location called Wizard's Hill where all these weird, creepy voices talk to you when you go up on Wizard's Hill. And in one instance, you, you run into the black man who's a, an incarnation of Nyarlathotep, and he offers you a deal. And he says, you know, would you like five clue tokens and five dollars, which is a very good deal in Arkham Horror. And you're like, maybe? <laughs> and the rest of the card says, if you accept his deal, and then goes to bold text, remember that you've made a deal with the black man of Wizard's Hill. And that's all it says. <laughs> and I'm like, that seems seems awfully good. Is there a catch? Uh, maybe. <laughs> and so, sure, I'll do this. Fine, that'll be great. And then later on, uh, it's possible that coming out of the Mythos deck will come a card called Old Debts Come Due. Um, and that one says, basically, everything's fine unless someone has made a deal with the Dark Man of Wizard's Hill. <laughs> In which case, they're devoured and put three, three doom tokens on the board for every one investigator who made the deal. And everything's horrible and bad, and they probably just lost the game. Um, I happened to walk past a group of uh, gamers at a convention one time, just when that card came up. And, and they immediately started shouting at one of the guys at the table, We told you, don't you know, you, you made that stupid deal, man, you killed us all. And uh, I think that may have been my favorite con moment ever, honestly. <laughs> they were so pissed. It was great. That guy, he looked, he was just, oh, I'm sorry, guys. And I was just like, ah. <laughs> All right, next question. <coughs> gotcha. <laughs> um, so actually, I have now three questions. All right. Oh, thank you for keeping me well supplied. Well, well. Uh, two from my friends and one personally from me. Okay. So, first of all, have you played uh, Arkham Horror, the game, with all expansions? Oh, yeah. We've done it several times at conventions. Well, how was it? Short. <laughs> <laughs> you want it? No. <laughs> it's pretty murderous when you have all the expansions going at once, actually. Or it can be particularly quick and bloody. <laughs> That's okay. It makes for a good convention event sometimes. <laughs> okay. So my friends and I wanted to ask you, <coughs> would you like to play with us one round if you have time? <laughs> well, if you catch me around the convention, sure. Maybe not tonight, but uh, catch me sometime at the convention and sure. Okay. Uh, and, the third <laughs> <laughs> and the third question. Um, have any of your fans asked, asked actually you to do some characters and have you ever done that or do you just take them from the book? Um, the characters are generally, uh, a lot of the names are taken from people I know, uh, friends of mine and such, uh, and just kind of twisted into kind of Lovecraftian names as much as possible. Um, uh, there's a, there's a program out there, a computer program called Strange Eons, which uh, lets people make their own cards, characters, any component they want at all for Arkham Horror. And it was done by a really talented fan of the game who's a great computer programmer. Um, and I think everybody kind of uses that to get their, their, their needs fulfilled for that sort of thing. There's a ton of custom stuff out there. People have done everything from Sherlock Holmes as an investigator to... Uh, Oh, geez. Uh, Sailor Moon. <laughs> uh, the, the Ghostbusters, the Scooby-Doo gang, 
uh, I think it's brilliant. And you know, I, I love that it exists and that people do that with it. So it just lets people have more fun with the game. So. I was wondering if you had any funny quote you have heard during Arkham Horror or something. And uh, I might share one of ours. Well, let's see. Uh, we have, I can tell this first. So okay, go for we it. We had a custom strange young character, a madman who re regains sanity. Ah, oh, yes. I actually at being character. in the other world. Uh, I, think so, I, I think I've seen that one, sure. Yeah, and the quote was, I'm going to riot to restore my sanity. Mm. <laughs> that seems like a bad plan. <laughs> But uh, one of the earliest stories I have from Arkham Horror was early on in the playtesting. Um, I was playing Ash Can Pete, of course, and he pretty much starts with no money to speak of because uh, he's a hobo. Uh, and there was the, the flying polyp went up in the sky. And the flying polyp is this horribly murderous, death-dealing monster. It's one of the worst things you can run into the game. And in the sky, if you're out in the streets, he can swoop down on you, and now you have to deal with him. And he's tough to avoid and everything. So I was just like, okay, I need to get off the streets. So I ran into the closest location, which was the library. And the encounter I had was there, uh, overdue book fines, pay $2 or be moved to the street. <laughs> and I was just like, I just imagined, poor Ash, I got no money. Don't, don't throw me in the street. There's things, there's things, I tell you. And, you know, out into the street he goes, and down came the polyp the next turn, killed me. Uh, just massacred me, and I was just like, it's just a book. Why would you do this? <laughs> okay, so I would maybe like to hear something about the Game of Thrones board game. So maybe two things, specifically. Mm -hmm. Like, in many ways, I think it is much more streamlined than many of the other uh, Fantasy Flight games. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would want to hear something about the design process. And the second thing is that the first edition on which, which where you were, you were working on, if I've understood correctly, mm -hmm. so it had these some subtle but hilariously game-breaking flaws, I guess, which were fixed in the second edition. So I would like to hear about this sort of design side of this game. All right, sure. Um, basically, uh, Christian Peterson was the main designer on the game. He's the the CEO of Fantasy Flight Games. And uh, he came up with a lot of the big concepts of it, the, the order tokens that you put out on the board and the way those resolve was all him. Um, I was basically tasked to doing a lot of the, the grunt work, the, the detail work. And so I designed the way the map is laid out. I designed uh, the character cards in the game, came up with the way that the stars work for the raven. Um, and <coughs> so that was the kind of stuff I did there. Um, I will say that the design that was published was very different than the first design I played of the game, which used uh, D6s, D8s, and D10s in a, an elaborate combat system. And the thing about that was there was this uh, rule in the game that if you rolled ones, enemy archers, that meant an enemy archer had killed one of your units. So your own dice would kill your kill your guy and I was at the play I was at the play test for this and I was a very new employee at the time so this was a really dumb thing for me to do but I, you know uh, I went up and I attacked a city and I had it outnumbered like four to one and I rolled the dice and I want to say like three quarters of my dice came up one and so my army massacred itself <laughs> and I was left with like two guys sitting there which immediately died to a hail of you know enemy dice and I was like and I just pounded the table and I said what no this can't be right you this is no good I refuse to play this game again if this rule stays in and then I realized what it said and I was just like if that's okay um, you know. <laughs> and uh but but the the boss he went back and he rethought this and he was thought more about it and uh went with a system that was kind of partially lifted from uh Lord of the Rings, the confrontation, not, not entirely, but there was similarities with the way the, 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 the characters worked in both games. And, uh, and so it became much more of a, a kind of a Euro Ameritrash hybrid game, um, which I think was actually a very good space for it. Um, 
And so I think that addresses the first part of the question. Uh, the other part with the, uh, the first edition versus the second edition stuff and the, the, the ports particularly, I imagine, is what you're referring to. Well, yeah, that was just the sort of thing that just, it just didn't come up in play testing when we did it. And, you know, it was a bad surprise for us later on. And so we we're just like, or maybe we just fix it like this. Yeah, that's a good idea. All right. And uh, so, you know, that happens. But uh, one of the things you have to realize is that you can play a game 50 times with your play testers and such. And then when you release it, that first month that you release it, if you sell a couple thousand copies and every one of those people plays it one time, they've already played it 20 times as much as you've ever played the game, no matter how hard you've put into playtesting. So things kind of emerge from the soil that first month or so of, of public release where you're just like, oh, yeah, okay, uh, we can make this better. Give us a minute. And, and that's just kind of the reality of, of producing games professionally. Uh, some companies spend a long, long time on games to the point where the, that's if they, if they feel like they've polished it to perfection. Or a lot of games that, games that companies publish are actually much simpler than the sort of games that Fantasy Flight publishes, and those are easier to 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 play test and polish. But when you're dealing with a very complicated game with lots of different rules, exceptions, and things like that, you're always going to have these wacky. Uh, instances that you just can't predict when it gets into players' hands and it gets into the hands of particularly evil players who are just like, I think I can break this. Hang on a minute. <laughs> ah! And you're just like, yeah, good job. All right. Uh, crap. Yeah, there we go. We fixed it. Ha-ha. And broken again. <sighs> so, you know, it's, it's kind of a game. I feel like the players play with the designers. It's how bad can we break your game? So... Next question, who's got the, the cube? All right. Okay. Uh, there's a um, few comments about editions. Uh, there was a Game of Thrones Descent and even the Ar new Arkham Horror that most everybody knows compared to the old one, which I've actually played, which was sort of strange. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, uh, have you got any game design commentary on when is it proper or a good idea to release a new edition? When do you just use errata to fix problems, when do you add in stuff through use of expansions? What's the, how do you decide those? When, when, when is which, which one appropriate decision to do for the game? Well, basically if a game stops selling, it's either time to put it away or make a new edition of it. Um, there's no reason necessarily to just leave it, you know, if you just leave it alone and it stops selling, well, it's, it's a bad idea any way you look at it. Um, Sometimes you'll you retire a game for a few years and kind of let interest in it build back up again, and then you'll put it out in a new edition, or you even might release the old edition again if you feel like that interest in it has grown again, but usually that takes a long time for that to happen. Um, one of the things, too, is that there's no such thing as when I designed a game, I got it exactly right. It doesn't happen. It's, that's, it seems to me that it, that would be impossible. Um, as soon as a game is published, I already see things that I would do different every time. Um, and, and I feel like that's a good thing too, though. Uh, otherwise, I'm not really getting better over time. I'm not really uh, spotting new things and, and growing as a designer. Um, so when I revisit a game that's a couple years old, like if I did a new edition of Magdar now, which was my first board game, it would look very different than the edition that I put out at the time because that was 10 years ago and I'm certainly a much better designer than I was at the time. Um, so I, I feel like editions do serve a good purpose. Uh, they can roll in a bunch of changes into the new thing and now this becomes the new standard of the game and it's very improved and kind of uh, uh, solidified as a result of that. Um, I feel like sometimes editions are trotted out too soon to each other, and I think that's a problem. You don't really want to, to keep stacking them up like that because you don't want to make people rebuy the thing all the time like that. It's, it keeps, creates a lot of resentment among players, and for good reason. Um, so I think that's, that's my feelings on editions. Um, next question, I think. Oop. 
I have a couple of questions about the Sid Meier's Civilization board right. game. Um, earlier you said a couple of words about the game and said something like almost perfect balance uh, between the win conditions. It was close-ish. Almost perfect balance. Which, which way is, is the easiest or the most common? Um, I think it turned out that with just the base set, uh, the economic victory turned out to be the easiest, ultimately. Uh, for some, some people found a way to twist it in a horrible little way that made it a little bit easier, and they finished off like a turn or two ahead of everybody else. And that was unexpected and just kind of slipped in there. Um, all the other victory conditions were pretty close. Um, technology is probably a little bit slower than the others, unless you're playing Russia or unless you have the, the right cards that you draw into. Um, so, like I said, it's pretty close, but there's a bit of variation between them, and uh, <coughs> part of that depends on kind of knowing the little tricks and ins and outs of the game that you can kind of abuse for your own sadistic pleasure. So, right, right. Uh, there's a new expansion coming out this, I think, this summer. Uh, were you involved with the design of that expansion? I, I did a version of it. Um, the version I did doesn't look very much like it is now, so they've done a lot of redevelopment work on it. Uh, again, that's fine. Uh, I did the first expansion. That was largely mine. Um, and again, we had some other little things slip in there. But I think, like, overall, that one added a lot of new new life to the game. And the, the new expansion looks very good, too, as well. Um, it's uh, the, They've got to social policies, which are kind of like a different way to do governments or something. It looks pretty neat, actually. So. Right. Um, so I didn't have a lot to do with that part of the game, but I did some of the initial designs and some of the uh, some of the new uh, nations, I guess, are mine. So. Right. Right. Uh, next question. All right. Oh, there we go. Oop. <clears throat> What motivates you to come to cons? Mm, I'm sorry, I couldn't Ma hear. What motivates you to come to cons and events like this? Um, well, in this case, it was a free trip to Finland, which I thought <laughs> was pretty cool. Um, and uh, it was a very nice invitation. And, and they said, you know, come to our convention. And, and it's in Finland. And I said, Finland? I have never thought of going to Finland. I should go to Finland. <laughs> uh, and here I am, really. But uh, in general, with conventions, a lot of it is putting your games in front of people and showing them off to people and just making sure that that people are aware that they're out there. It's it's a promotional thing that you have to do as a designer. Uh, it's a lot of artists uh, go to conventions and stuff and do sketches and things like that. And it's a very similar process uh, for, for designers as well. Um, you know, uh, for any creative professional, kind of uh, attention is lifeblood almost. It's it's how you get your sales and how you keep being able to make a living at what you do. So, um, conventions are great and they're, they're a lot of fun too. Frankly, it's uh, I get to be a rock star for a couple of days, and <laughs> you know, in my town, nobody knows who I am and nobody cares. But I come out here and I can talk about games, and people actually know who I am, and it's pretty cool. You know, uh, and then I can go home and turn that back off, and it's great. So, this is about your career as a game designer. Mm -hmm. What is the most embarrassing thing you're willing to admit with publicly? Hmm. Let's see. Most embarrassing. Uh, that's a tough one. <laughs> so many choices. Um, hmm. I guess, I guess the, the, the most embarrassing thing it's probably, uh, yeah, that, that was pretty embarrassing. So in, uh, in Sid Meier's Civilization, the board game, um, you know, I was, was kind of in a rush towards the end, and we put the game out, and I got the rule book, and I looked at it, and I realized that there was no rules for if you bought a wonder in the, in the market, how do new wonders enter the game ever? So as written in the rule book, there were four wonders, and then these other cards were just there for some strange, mysterious reason. <laughs> um, and they just would sit in the box, I guess. I don't know. So we immediately got onto online and said, okay, whoops, uh, 
actually, we meant that you should replace those when you buy them. Honest, we swear. Uh, and uh, I don't usually leave holes that big in a rule book, but that one just kind of floated right on through, and, you know, what are you going to do? So I swear, like, eight people looked at that thing and all just went, yep, looks good. <laughs> eh, you know, it happens, so. <laughs> people are only human after all, and sometimes that stuff just rolls right past everybody. Uh, <laughs> next question. Oh. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> At least it's soft. <laughs> uh, you said... Uh, you went online and, and posted a, an, an instant errata. Uh, how much interaction do you, as a designer, have with the fans uh, online? Um, well, uh, my interaction at the, when I was at Fantasy Flight was fairly limited. They didn't want too many people all talking to the fans and saying conflicting things and stuff. So we had like a couple people whose job it was, here you guys talk specifically. And so I would mostly write articles that would go up on the website occasionally. These days, uh, it's a bit more. Uh, I have like a Twitter feed that I, that I keep up to date, and I've actually been tweeting about being here at Ropacon and having the black sausage the other day, which was pretty interesting, actually kind of tasty. Um, and I also have a blog that I update every month. Not this month, I've been super busy, but in general, I talk about what I've been doing and, and, and where my career is going and that sort of thing. Adventures in freelancing, I call it. And that's over on my website. Um, and then I do talk to the fans a bit more these days on like, well, uh, once there's more games out that I've done that aren't Fantasy Flight games at this point, uh, I'll be answering rules questions and stuff online for those too. Uh, with, with the Fantasy Flight games, obviously I'm not going to go online and answer rules questions now that I'm not an employee. Yeah. That could get awkward for everybody involved. So I'm just kind of like, uh, go talk to them, it'd be great. So that's kind of what I've been doing these days is more like Twitter and, and blogging and stuff. So, Yeah, uh, as a sort of a continuation question, uh, playtesting uh, these days, is, is it, as a freelancer, uh, do, you, do you have a local circle of friends who playtest or do you out, send the uh, games I, out? I've got about five different groups in my area, uh, Twin Cities, Minneapolis, in that area are actually really good for gaming because it's winter, a very long period of the year, and so people will need something to do inside a lot of times. Uh, so there's lots of board gamers there, and like I said, I've got like five different groups or so. And then uh, I also do playtesting. There's a, Alan Moon runs a convention uh, called The Gathering of Friends that I go to every year if I can. Uh, and that's kind of like, I can get a bunch of playtesting done there with a bunch of very smart gamers, which is nice. Uh, and then I have a couple friends kind of around the world that I will occasionally send a, a prototype to if I think it needs some outside eyeballs on it, if I'm not sure that the company I'm working with is going to have that capacity to do that or not. Um, most can, but some of them are kind of still new at the board game thing, and you have to make sure you give them a little bit of extra hand-holding. So um, I think that's got it. And uh, next question. Are we on time? Yeah, we got some more time. Uh, anybody have any more questions? Uh, over here, here we go. <laughs> okay, so you've been in Finland how long? I'm sorry, you have to speak closer to the... Yeah. How long have you been in Finland now? Uh, how long have I been freelancer? Finland. In Finland. Finland, oh, since... Uh, I guess... Tuesday? No, Wednesday I got here. It all blurs together a little bit on that plane ride. <laughs> Um, so only a couple days, really. So it's been nice. Okay, that was actually my question. What have you th <laughs> thought about Finland? Uh, it's just been a lot of fun. It's an interesting country, and the, the city around here. And they drove me around Helsinki and showed that to me, and took me boating and everything. It was very cool. Uh, it's actually a very pretty area, very green, which I like. Um, similar to the Twin Cities, actually, in, a, in the Minneapolis area. It's very green for a big city in the U.S., uh, a lot of the big cities in the U.S. are very concrete and not many plants and not many things. And so when I first moved to the Twin Cities, I was surprised at how green everything was and how many plants there were. And this is way more than that here even, too. So I was favorably impressed by that. I always like to see lots of plants and trees around the area. It makes it nicer. Um, 
And like I said, I tried the sausage. That was pretty good. Um, they took me to a garlic restaurant where everything had garlic. And that was pretty good, too. And I've, I've had a good time overall. It's been a nice, nice experience. Everybody's been a lot of fun, so. So what about Ropecon? Uh, I'm sorry, what? What about Ropecon? Ropecon's been a good time. Um, I wasn't exactly expecting everything so far, but uh, you know, I, I, I wasn't. I, I don't think I really knew ahead of time that they were going to put me up on the stage during the opening, uh, opening ceremony. But uh, all right, I, can, I managed okay, I guess. Um, that was and and the the ceremony was fun. The band was good, um, and I've just been enjoying myself so far. It's been a good time. Um, and it's actually uh, very similar in a lot of ways to some of the conventions I've been to in the United States. There's an, uh, a convention in Las, Las Angeles that I've go to that I've gone to a bunch of times. It's kind of similar but a bit smaller. So, yeah, really. All right. Yeah, there's always fun stories in retail. So, what sort of favorites or worst experiences did you have in your game store days? You mentioned working there for a couple of years. Oh, uh, geez. Um, there was this one group that was friends with the game store owner, and uh, they'd been gaming there for years on Friday night, and they played Dungeons and Dragons, some horrible mutated house-ruled versions of Dungeons and Dragons with uh, unicorn druids, and somebody was playing a version of the Giver, and all this stuff, and it was pretty, you know, I was like, I'd try not to listen, frankly, and I, oh god, but uh, I, I remember that they came in one week and felt, smelt very, someone in the group smelt very, very ripe and just had kind of come to find out that their shower and their toilet had both broken. And somehow this was okay for them for like a week and that they still showed up at the store and it was just like, you know, I need to ask you to leave. Actually, I've never done this before. We, we, we don't really have this policy, but you gotta go, man. Go, go to a hotel, use their shower, something, anything. Um, I think that was probably the worst, kind of most horrible uh, experience I ever had as a game store clerk telling someone that that you stink way too bad to be in the store and you just have to go, man. Uh, that that was pretty bad. I think that was a low point there. Um, I don't know, good stories, there's plenty of good stories about uh, all sorts of good things that happened in the stores when I worked there and lots of nice people and everything for the most part. I have a lot of fond memories of it. For Nothing really stands out specifically. Um, questions? There's some back there maybe or whichever you feel comfortable throwing up the out. <laughs> Yeah, you've been mostly talking about role playing um, board games so far. Any comments or stories? Uh, what was fun or awful in the role playing side that you did before board games? Um, role playing games were a lot more work, actually, in a lot of ways. Um, when I did role playing game writing, I actually had close to like, on average, twelve to sixteen hour days um, to hit the deadlines. Then, um, so when I switched over to board games and could work normal hours for most of the year. That was kind of a big, vast relief for me. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the other thing, <coughs> oh, geez, sorry. The other thing about being an RPG writer that I always really kind of hated, and uh, you know, there's, there's a shirt that often circulates around at game conventions which says, don't tell me about your character. Not only would people tell me about their character and the campaigns they were running, uh, I often had people come up to me asking me to overrule their GMs for them. You know, my GM says this, but I looked in the rule book and it says this. I was like, well, sure, but it's your GM's game. He can do whatever he wants in that game, and I'm not about to overrule him for you. And they would be very offended and horrified by that. And I was just like, yeah, he's putting all that work in to run the game for you, man. You know, show some, show some gratitude. So it was a very weird, awkward kind of situation that I never really enjoyed for that part. Um, so I think that was my least favorite part about working in the role-playing stuff, was having people ask me to overrule their GM for them. It was very weird. Um, next question. Go long, look out. 
So I have a specific question about the Game of Thrones. Okay. When you designed it, did you predict that it might have a side effect of destroying relationships? Well, it was kind of a design goal, really. <laughs> <coughs> As you can tell, I, I have not the most healthy relationship with my fans sometimes when it comes to the stuff that I'm designing in there. Um, I don't know. I work out my aggressions with my game design sometimes. Uh, uh, that one was based kind of off diplomacy too, and you know if you've ever heard of diplomacy, the board game, that one's kind of pretty legendary for destroying friendships that are of twenty years long, and they never <laughs> spoke to each other again. Um, and so, if you build a game based off of that engine, yeah, there's probably going to be some hard hard feelings somewhere somehow. But at the same time, you know, it's it's very appropriate for the show. You know, there's. There's some uh, lovely backstabbing moments there, so. Uh, next question. Um, quick anecdote about diplomacy. Uh, last time I played mm -hmm. uh, with my brother, I think it was 10 years ago, and I stabbed, <laughs> I stabbed him in the back so bad that uh, we didn't spoke for, uh, speak for maybe two days or something, <laughs> and uh, I was never allowed to play with his friends this diplomacy game again. <laughs> but uh, the question is, uh, as a game designer, how do you, uh, let's say, uh, manage in advance or plan the expansions and everything so that there's no conflict? For example, uh, this defense uh, stops all attacks cards and somebody, some other expansion slot has uh, this attack penetrates all defenses card and then you're, then you're left wonder which one applies and which one doesn't. Well, uh, I, have, I have encountered this in other games, that expansion slots uh, don't work together anymore or don't make any sense. Well, you know, if, if, you, if you go digging through Arkham Horror heavily enough, there's 3,000-something cards in the game, all told, if not more. And when you get all the moving pieces together, it's something like 7,000 game components. You know, and it's a hell of a table full of stuff. Um, I'm pretty sure there's rule conflicts in there somewhere because, you know, there's 7,000 pieces moving around the table. Something is going to get in a fight with something else eventually. Um, so you kind of just, you try to be tidy about how your, your, your rules language is and that's all you can do. So, so you just try to avoid the absolutes to say that this stops everything, <laughs> this trumps everything and just... Yeah. Have, have some have some kind of a, like leveling or part of it is is mostly just to uh, just kind of be tidy and 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 you cross your cross your t's and dot your i's carefully when you're when you're designing things and hopefully your structure that you've designed is solid and as long as that structure is solid then all the individual parts will usually be okay on it too um, even when you carry it out to you know seven thousand parts as long as the plan is good. And usually you're okay. Um, so it's all about being careful in the early stages when you're when you're creating the plan. So um, is that good? All right. Mm -hmm. Next question then. If we had somebody in the back that wanted a question earlier. Oh, right over there. Uh, about the uh, playtesting. So when you worked at the Fantasy Flight Games, uh -huh. uh, do you always uh, test uh, with same people, or do you play one or two games with uh, people from the role-playing game department, and then another day play a couple of games with the guard game department people? Or yeah, as much as possible, they rotate play testers for for a game and get as many different people to play it um, as possible. Uh, these days, they've actually gone to a much more elaborate series of testing where they actually have about 40 or 50 copies of the game actually manufactured and shipped over. And then they call that the beta now. And they send that out to play tester groups and they have them play with the actual game components. And then they do another round of edits and send that out, which uh, Fantasy Flight had to reach a certain size before they could really afford to do that level of, of testing. But now they've got that in place. So that's I think that's pretty pretty good these days. Right, right. Um, and yeah, it's always good to rotate the 
rotate the playtesters for the most part, and then you also want like a group or two that gets good at the game, that becomes skilled at it, um, so that you can kind of have some more high-level playtesting too as, as you go on. So those are the two things, is I rotate most, and I kind of keep one group for the, for the repeat plays, so. All right, all right. All right, uh, next question. We're pretty much almost out of time here. We got about seven minutes. Hello. Yeah. Do you got Twitter? Uh, what? Twitter. Twitter? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's uh, Kevin Wilson forty two. Forty two. Yeah. Okay. Gonna subscribe. Because that's the answer, of course. Okay. Gonna subscribe. <clears throat> Do you read a lot fantasy science fiction? Yeah, I've read. Uh, I've probably read a bookstore or two of science fiction and fantasy at this point over the years. Does it help with the game design? Yeah, I think so. It gives me a lot of uh, material to work with, ultimately. A lot of different ideas, exposure to different things. Although, you know, I could probably be wider read in other genres. I haven't read a ton of romance, for instance, or mystery. But, you know, you like what you like, so. What is your favorite fantasy race? Race, fantasy race. I don't know if I have a favorite fantasy race, but I have a least favorite fantasy race. <laughs> and that is? That would be elves. <laughs> <laughs> the smug bastards. <laughs> All right. Uh, next question. Up back. Watch the soda. Uh, what, were, what are your longest and shortest game in Arkham Horror? Um... Three turns is the shortest, um, and that just was a disaster of every gate just opened somewhere new and horrible stuff happened. Um, longest, I think, was about four hours, um, which just we just couldn't get it all to, to come together, and gate bursts kept popping open gates and things like that. But at the same time, the doom wasn't quite moving along as fast as it ought to. So it was just like, oh god, it won't end. But uh, that was a very extreme case for us. So, all right, five minute warning. Uh, let's have maybe one more question or so, and uh, then we'll let people clear out in time for the next uh, event. Uh, so you had a website and a blog. Uh, yeah, there's a, my website is uh, WilsonCreativeLLC.com. Uh, LLC is like limited liability company. So it's like the company name part. So WilsonCreativeLLC.com. And if you go there, it has like a list of all my games that I've published and the blog. And then there's some, uh, the, the, the Island of Misfit Bits, which is just pictures of these weirdly manufactured game pieces that I've collected over the years, uh, you know, just for some novelty. And then there's also a list of my convention appearances that are upcoming, things like that. So, um, so that's my website. Um, one more, I think we got time. Uh, let's let's go here. Can you sign this? I sure can. Sure, no Thank problem. You. Just come up afterwards. Okay, so we can get one more. <laughs> Almost twice. Yeah. So uh, you have this generation hex coming. Uh, would you like to say a few words about that before you close? Ah, sure. Um, Generation Hex is based on a small press comic book in the U.S. called Finding Gossamer. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And it's kind of a more Euro-style game uh, where you're laying tiles out on a board. The, the concept is that you're all magic students at a magical school in the setting, uh, kind of like a Hogwarts kind of thing, and it's your final exams, and you're making magic items and casting spells in order to be the valedictorian of the school. So that's that's the that's the idea of the game. So um, if you want, I'll be running it around the convention. Come by and check it out. All right, I, I think that's all we have time for. And uh, thank you all very much for coming and uh, helping me use up all the time with questions.
Ropecón.